Welcome back to the Middling Along podcast. My guest this time is Kate Moore Youssef. She is passionate about all things well-being. She's a writer, she's a coach, a podcaster, and also facilitates workshops in this space. Welcome along, Kate. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So I think I became aware of you through uh, the article that you were featured in uh, about talking about your ADHD diagnosis later in life and you were diagnosed at the same time as your your daughter Mm -hmm. that's right um so how how did you come to to sort of go for that testing and and diagnosis in the first place so funny that you mentioned the article so the article was in vogue I mean I never thought I'd ever ever be in vogue and (laughs) why that one off the off the list the bucket list yeah literally it was hilarious it's like that was never you know part of my my thing and then it just ended up um being um, a friend who's a journalist who was really interested in ADHD diagnosis in women especially sort of later on in life so that was an interesting one I mean I wish it was for my fashion sense or like you know something more exciting (laughs) but um but that's you know there, there you go but it was what was amazing about it, it brought a lot of awareness and there was a lot of people, you know, coming to me and saying, oh my God, wow, I read that article and, I, you know, I think that's me or I think that's my mum or that's my daughter. Um, and the reason why I came across my own diagnosis is that ADHD has always been part of my family um but it's not I never really kind of thought it was me it was my brothers um I'd seen it in sort of other family members and then it was over lockdown and we were homeschooling my daughter who was nine at the time and I just kept sort of seeing that she just wasn't able to sit and focus Mm -hmm. and she couldn't we it wasn't a surprise because we'd had issues through her schooling. You know, we kept, we'd kept we gone for different right. testing, dyslexia, dyspraxia. But you've maybe never seen it at such close quarters before. Exactly. I've never seen her not being able to sort of focus and not being able to sort of keep that, inf- retain the information. And, you know, there would be a comprehension and she'd just be completely overwhelmed by the sheer amount of text and the questions. And it would just be so much for her that the, she just couldn't do it. The same with maths. And obviously, you know, she's in a state school and being in a state school, you know, kids get lost in classes. She's very quiet. She's very unassuming. Good, a really well-behaved good girl. You know, she's not disruptive. Yeah. So she's not getting the attention because she's no. not kicking and off. She, does, she doesn't want the attention. So even mm. if she's not understanding what's going on in class, she wouldn't put a hand up. And I remember being exactly the same. I kept thinking, oh my God, it's so similar. Like I just drift off and daydream and look out the window and a whole class would be gone. I'd be like, I don't know anything. Like, I don't know the facts. And I'd have to write an essay and it'd be like, well, where's all this information meant to come from? And so I, I really struggled with maths as well throughout my whole, you know, school. And then at university, it showed up and everything was last minute. And I just couldn't retain information. I think that's what I could retain it on a bigger picture. So mm. if someone says to me, what did you learn in lecture or what did you read in that essay or that book I could give them a one snapshot but anything with detail and specific you know information it would just be like gone so then this light bulb moment happened and I and I thought you know what I think she's got ADHD and I looked into it and I looked at the symptoms of girls and boys I had two brothers who had very I say excessive ADHD or intense whatever you want to call it growing up and they you know were just disruptive hard to they couldn't sit in class it was very hard for them to to learn um, back in the 80s, ADHD wasn't easily, maybe it was easily diagnosed in boys, but it wasn't easily looked looked after, mm. you know. Pe- and, and does it manifest diff- very differently in boys and girls or is that it's a bit simplistic? Yeah, no, boys typically it is that kind of naughty boy, disruptive, loud, impulsive joker all those things like just not able to sit in class and eventually teachers get annoyed with them they're not participating they're distracting other members of the Mm. class and if you aren't aware of what it looks like you've just got a naughty kid in your class who just doesn't want to learn and wants to distract other kids and that is why throughout the years you'll see ADHD boys especially that have dropped out of school very early on 
Um, there's a very high level of ADHD in crime because they've not been channeled the right way. Their energy, their, right. you know, they've not been nurtured. Mm-hmm. It's, it has, it's not just a naughty boy in class just has to sort of muddle along. There's massive, huge issues going through life if it's not diagnosed and looked after properly. Whereas with girls, there's a lot of more masking, internalizing. Very often, you know, obviously there's, you know, the louder girls and the girls that are really are very sort of inattentive and hyperactive. But the ones who are sort of holding that in and bring it manifest in anxiety and depression and eating disorders because they right. can't understand why it's almost like they've turned inward exactly. and instead of having that kind of outward expression of what's happening for them exactly yeah and that is why it goes so undetected in girls so that you'll see girls with anxiety issues but they won't make the correlation between what's going on in class and in school maybe how they're delivering their homework or not being able to um focus or they are constantly late or they're daydreaming so yeah. many different things that are going on but they could be highly articulate highly creative but because it's not been picked up it can develop and mental health problems can you know come from that so I was really grateful when my daughter was diagnosed and all of a sudden it was a big fat mirror up against me because mm-hmm. it was like tick 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 I even went back to my school reports and reread them and it was Kate is easily distracted Kate is highly creative but never hands her homework in on time Kate um is constantly chatting in class no 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 no. it was just like everything but because girls are just you know and I remember being silly and going off in the garden and talking to myself and playing and all these things that I think just sometimes it just gets you just miss it Mm. but I knew I could have done better in all my studies I knew at university I wasn't I was had to be self-led so I didn't get the grades that I wanted to get even though I was I know I've got the intellect for it and it throughout my life it kept popping up and manifesting in lots of different ways so when my daughter was diagnosed I was like right I'm gonna go and it was just a two-hour consultation I had to go privately because if you have to wait, there's a ridiculous waiting list and it's a huge, it's a broken system. You know, thankfully I'm sort of privileged to be able to pay for the private diagnosis. And it was two hours later. Yeah. I mean, you've got it quite severely. And it was just this epiphany of, it was just like, oh, thank God. Okay. (laughs) I thought I was broken. I thought there was something wrong with me. Like I I thought I was lazy, flaky, all these words I kept calling myself. Why can't I stick at things? Why can't I see see things through? Just beating yourself up for years and years and years over something that you you could have had help with. It it does seem like there's, uh, there's been a real wave of women kind of picking this up much later in life. And as you said, sort of many of those have come to you for help I think someone termed it this sort of lost generation you know that Mm. sort of suddenly they're like you they're finding this sort of light bulb goes off about things that have the experiences that they've been through and and just sort of rediscovering themselves do you do you feel differently about yourself now post that diagnosis yeah I really do actually and I think you're right you know that lost generation of women is it's a very poignant term because Mm. you know like I mentioned before I would just i I just thought I I was lazy. I thought there was something wrong with me. Why couldn't I be like other women? And don't get me wrong, I've got four kids and my kids are always fed, dressed, got to school. I've got an amazingly organized husband, thank God (laughs) for him being like, the we sort of, you know, compliment each other in lots of different ways. But some women aren't, don't have partners that are as, you know, as organized as that. And I do sometimes wonder, you know, if he wasn't as organized, what would have happened? But again, Mm. why beat myself up? I had spent lots of time, you know, berating myself. So I think a diagnosis just helped me understand my brain a little bit more and understand that it's okay to have challenges and it's okay to harness and embrace the stuff that I am good at and find people to fill in those gaps and I and I always felt guilty I was like well I've got you know someone help helping me with I should be able to do it everyone should be able to do do everything yeah (laughs) and women it's just this ridiculous notion that women we tell ourselves that we should be able to do everything and if we delegate and if we don't do something um ourselves well we're lazy or we're 
privileged and we're mm-hmm. this or we're that. And um, we need help, ADHD or not. We need help. We need to know when we have to just hold our hands up and go, I can't do it all. And so I just think with ADHD, it just magnifies some of the things that you, I do find challenging. And what I find challenging seems to be quite a normal thing for someone with ADHD to find challenging. Mm. Um, so is that the, the sort of the organizational yeah so it's executive functioning and and my brain works I could be in the kitchen and I will be like I'm meant to do the dishwasher and something in the corner of my eye will just you know oh there's a shelf over there and I spot a bit of dust and I'm halfway through the emptying the dishwasher I'll go and wipe the <laughs> dust off the shelf and then I'll see my kid's school bag that's not been put away and I'll be like oh and then I see there's an empty water bottle in there and and it's literally it was like all I did was go into the kitchen to empty a dishwasher and I could have lost an hour and a half doing loads of other jobs in the kitchen. And then I realized I've got a Zoom call and I've not prepped for the Zoom call or all these different things. And so even though it's like these small things throughout your life, it's exhausting. And so you're more, men- you're more mentally drained. You, are, you feel depleted more, so, but you can't understand why because you think, oh, well, what if I haven't actually achieved anything. So it's a bit of a spiral of constantly going you know bringing yourself back to that present moment and bringing yourself back to okay right I need to write a list I need to focus on you know all the things that I can do today not all the things I need to do in a week in two hours today and we kind of think that we can do all of that because sometimes when we are really focused it's called hyper focus we could probably do something way faster than someone without ADHD because we're so focused so if I know I have to write an article and it's got to be in for tomorrow, I will bang out that article quicker than I've ever done. In my life. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, so it's superpower. <laughs> superpowers. And there's lots of annoying challenges as well. And you know, it depends how the severity of your ADHD as well. I know there's a lot of women who struggle just getting up in the morning, getting out of bed, mm. struggle to get their kids to school, to feed themselves. It, it's can be so debilitating on from so many different levels on and then the men, mental health side emotional well-being is just not yeah. sick so you can kind of laugh at some of the things but other things I you know I've had clients who come to me and just just can't do the most simple things because their executive functioning is mm-hmm. not there and then the spiral of the self-criticism and their self-worth and their self-esteem it's just like, why I'm a woman, I'm a mother, why can't and I do... all of those years of being felt as though they're, they're less than. Yeah. And they could have had that help. Exactly. Support. So um, you, you're an EFT practitioner. For anyone that hasn't heard of that before, what is EFT and how does it work in a nutshell? So um, EFT is emotional freedom te- technique. You might have heard it being called tapping as well. Mm-hmm. And this is something I came across about... 11 or 12 years ago and I I gone to someone for a counseling session therapy and it was after my I'd had a miscarriage it was quite late on I'd gone for my 12 week scan thought everything was fine and I found that I'd lost the baby and obviously I was very very traumatized and upset and I knew I wanted to have more children but I couldn't get past this miscarriage Mm. Um, and it was really holding me back and it was causing me a lot of sadness but also just I was so stuck I just I was like well it was meant to be and if I had try again what happens if it happens again and I was just stuck in this thought loop Mm. so I went thinking I was going to go for a traditional sort of counseling session and she said I'm going to do something um, called tapping and I had absolutely no idea it was the most bizarre experience but what happened after we did this EFT session is that it was just like this light bulb moment of, oh my God, like how did she get me out of my ruminations and my anxieties and get me to a point where I was, okay, that happened. I, you know, in acceptance of the situation. To to be able to move on. Yeah, Yeah, couldn't change it, but I can change the way I feel and move on. And it was just, it was an amazing, it was one hour. Um, And then shortly after I went on to conceive um, my the child and it was fabulous because I went through that pregnancy and, and I didn't have the fears that I thought I was going to have so um that was that and then as I started training in in coaching and doing lots of different sort of um diplomas and I kept coming back to to t- 
tapping and thinking I'd love to learn more about that. So I went and trained in it. And what I realized before I was diagnosed with ADHD is that this is one thing that is amazing at calming down um, a very overactive brain, a brain that likes to overthink, ruminate, can project right into the future of all the what ifs, which I'm brilliant at. I can lie awake at three o'clock in the <laughs> oh, morning. Oh, same. <laughs> What's the worst that could happen? Let me plan it out in yeah. intricate detail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and these, and this gives you almost like a bit of a platform to, to do all of that. But you're tapping on these acupressure points that are calming your body, calming, reducing the cortisol in your body. There's scientific evidence to show that this is, you know, they check, they test the cortisol, uh, really? the amygdala in your brain, which is the sort of the fight or flight Response. area is, yeah. is, is calming down and everything in your body just feels calmer, even though you're talking about something that potentially could be quite stressful. So I realized that this was an amazing opportunity for women and men and whoever children with ADHD to be able to talk about things that are worrying that they do you know think about all the things that they the acceptance of themselves you know self-acceptance and bring it to a head in a calming way so it's not like having typical therapy or a counseling session where it can be quite traumatic. You're triggering, you're talking about mm. lots of old things. Yes, you potentially could bring up old stories, beliefs, memories, but because you're calming your body at the same time, there will be tears, but you're not left kind of, you know, even more um, agitated than before the session. And what it does, it helps release a lot of old stuff. So you typically would come out of a session and just feel lighter, emotionally lighter, like this lit, sort of weight's just been lifted off your shoulders. And sometimes you don't even understand how or why. Seems like magic. It is. It, <laughs> it taps into a subconscious part of your brain where you're led to things that you don't even think, you know, bother you anymore. And very often throughout a tapping, you know, we've been doing it for 20 minutes, I'll say to a client, what's going on now? What are you thinking about? They go, well, this really random memories just popped up about mm. me and my class when I was 13. And my teacher said this to me and it's connected to their self-esteem and their self-worth now as like a 40 year old woman. And, and burying it and holding it and exactly. carrying it around with them. Yeah. So we do a bit of tapping around that and we sort of release that. And it's like, okay, I've been holding on to that for 20 odd years. And so... There's lots of revelations and perspective shifts. And that's, that's what I love about it because it allows you to clear things. You know, we collect as we go. It's just layer upon layer as adults. And we just kind of hold it in our bodies and hold it. And actually, we can release these things. It's okay. You know, there's, there's ways where we can, you know, just Let move it go. on. Interesting. And so um, had you yourself used that to sort of help manage your own ADHD behaviors yeah. and, and the sort of work through some of your what you were holding on to yourself yeah so as I went through the training so there's obviously lots of hours that you have to do um and I realized that I was you know when I was doing it with someone else how beneficial it was for me I then just started doing it on my own sort of just preventative you know tapping and uh, you can do it for two or three minutes in the morning every morning mm -hmm. you just sit up in bed and you don't have to have the words you can just do breathing and you can tap on the acupressure points and I'll explain about the acupressure points because what it is is it's sort of tapping the EFT is like western psychology mixed with this sort of eastern acupressure knowledge that you know for thousands of years whether it's sort of acupuncture or reflexology there's all these meridian points in our body that are release emotions and mm. stagnant beliefs um, that are connected to different organs in our body, but that gets complicated. But the tapping on the points that have been identified in EFT are exactly what we should be doing to release stored energy. So it's almost like having a congestion in your body and you're tapping on these points and it just releases that negative energy, that congested negative energy that's been there for a very long time. My mentor sort of explains it as like you've got a motorway system in your body and you've just got traffic that's like snarled up and different junctions. And so you're tapping on those kind of junction points and it releases all that traffic. It's and so you're free flowing free... again. Exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's the chi, it's the energy. But at the same time, you are 
saying things that you have held on to for a long time. But you can also use it as a type of meditation as well, which is what is great for an ADHD brain, mm. is that we find it hard to sit still and meditate traditionally, you know, without our brain going a million miles yeah. an hour. <laughs> so if we're using our hands, which is so good. you're focusing on that sort of physical input and that sort of repetitive exactly. element of the tapping and that's helping exactly. calm your brain down as well. Yeah. yeah. So that's it's fascinating. It is. And so a lot of sort of clients with ADHD will say, oh, I can't meditate. They find it really hard. Um, they need movement, which is why, you know, walking in nature can be a way of meditating for an ADHD brain. Mm. Um, it's not, it's not that it's, it's a huge pressure to sit there still <laughs> with your eyes closed <laughs> and just be like, right now think of nothing. And that's another thing that you feel like you failed at because exactly. like, I can't even meditate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So when I bring, I really, you know, I do it for myself is I'll just sit there in the morning and I'll just do some breathing, which for me is like a massive help as well. The tapping and you can, you know, speak if you want to speak or if you don't, you don't have to. And that is where I started noticing there is a great connection. And I was actually had a um, really fascinating conversation with someone in Canada two or three days ago. And she is doing lots of research. She's an academic and she's doing a huge amount of research between the connection of using EFT and ADHD. And between the two of us, we're like, we don't really know anyone else that really specifically focuses on the power of EFT because a lot of people use it for very deep trauma, mm. PTSD, yeah. um, fears, phobias, huge amounts of just really sort of deep rooted issues. But I just feel that the ADHD brain is just so well aligned for tapping it's got much more just, potential as a sort of everyday tool exactly yeah just reducing the end up being role. taught in schools and uh yes. having profound effect on on children as well potentially. yeah so when you if you're working with somebody um and using EFT specifically in that ADHD sort of sphere how many sessions would you typically have with them would it be sort of two or three or does it wholly depend on the individual yeah so it really does I mean I've had clients that come to me and it's just a one-off session because they just there's just one specific thing that Mm. they they just need some help with or yeah typically it's about two three four sessions where we uncover lots of different things at different time, you know, in different sessions. So, um, you know, I'd be like, what typically, you know, what's what you're struggling with today? Or we we started one thing in the last session. Do you want to pick that up or has something else come up from it? And what happens is after a session, two or three days later, things are still, you know, your cognition's kind of like, oh, actually, that's a different perspective than I thought I had on that. And things are coming in where energetically and this is where a tiny bit of the woo comes in and I love a bit of woo but you know if you're very science not for everyone but it's not for everyone <laughs> but it is energy it's like um the moving of the, mer- the meridians and mm. very often if your energy changes if you've had an issue with somebody you know very often I'll have people that come to me and go I just can't get past this problem with so and so very often something will crop up where that person will pick up the phone and go you know what let's just leave it let's just move move on or you know if it's an issue with the boss all of a sudden the boss will just be like you know what maybe I was wrong so energetically there there are things that can happen after a session that will lead to something different in the next session so but because it helps with so many different things you know from a very baseline like I'm doing a workshop tonight for for someone um, and she wants me to talk about procrastination um and we can just delve into procrastination with tapping you know why am I procrastinating what's the issue what's causing me what's the fear behind it and you can really use it as a way to self interrogate I don't know if that's the word but no that's that's what I was going to say sort of almost like getting sort of in inside to find out what's really happening it's like what what are you hiding behind exactly What's, what's the real kind of the deeper meaning behind something that you're sort of almost protecting yourself from and and not wanting to sort of address head on yeah it's stuff and it's stuff that we always know and that's what the thing is is with the tapping is I'm just facilitating it it's your your inner knowing and your inner wisdom is always there but we've because we've got layers over it hiding it and Mm. conditioning and society and parent parental beliefs and all these different things that we are just used to masking and covering 
the tapping just peels away layer by layer. And actually, you know, for example, procrastination, I'm meant to be doing this document. Actually, I'm not interested in this subject. And actually, I'm really, it's not bringing me joy, this job anymore, or this this angle that I've been, you know, pushing because I think I should be pushing it. And why am I doing that? And actually, I really want to be focusing on something else. And so it kind of um, illustrates maybe where you are going down the wrong path. Maybe you have um, your passions no longer lie in that area, but you can't admit it to yourself because you feel that rationally you should be doing that. But actually, yeah. from a sort of a soul perspective or however deep you want to look at it, you're, you're, you you want to do something else. And especially in our midlife and women and the hormonal changes and children growing up and life changing, everything, the dynamic shifting, you know, there's things shifting within us as well. And very often we think we should be that same person that we are at 25, 30. It's hard to embrace those changes sometimes and just be, yeah, I guess just sort of follow, follow that changing flow. It's like, no, well, no, I've, you know, that there's too much else going on or, you know, I'm not prioritizing myself. I'm, Mm. you know, I'm too busy looking after other people or, you know, I've trained to do this job for however many years and I, you know, couldn't possibly do something else. That's (laughs) yeah. And then it's the, you you then start noticing, okay, where are these expectations from? Where are these um, pressures coming from? Whose voice am I hearing that I shouldn't be doing this? And very often, you know, it could be a family member or an old teacher or a colleague or a friend. And it's like, and it's separating that from yourself and coming back and going within. and, And if I wasn't terrified, if I wasn't scared of judgment and, you know, fearful of all the repercussions of my truth, what would I really want to be doing? And that's what the tapping really does help with because it allows you, it's almost like a little kind of insight into that deeper part of you that you're too afraid to admit to even yourself and especially to anyone else. And so, yeah, I just think that women need to start recognizing that it's okay to ebb and flow and to change and move with cycles and be okay with being one person you know 10 years ago and a new person 10 years later uh, and that's life but we feel that we should be putting ourselves in a box and stay in that box and I told myself that for years it's like why can't I just be in that box that everyone else seems to put themselves in why do you keep changing and evolving and having new interests and I've now realized that I I'm a very curious person and I really enjoy learning and trying new things. And when things don't interest me anymore, I feel that it's okay to put them aside and try something new and just... Yeah, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Yeah, <laughs> but I've only just realised that. <laughs> <laughs> but that, no, it's, 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 you know, it's almost like, it's almost like you're not just allowed to sort of have, have a hobby and try it and enjoy it for a bit and then move on to something else it's got to be like oh I've got I've got to get good at it or I've got to somehow yeah I've got to stick with it I've kind of you know bought this equipment now so I must carry on doing yeah (laughs) I tried screen printing for a bit you know like a life lino cut printing and I love it but it's like okay I've got this stuff and it's just nagging me sitting in the drawer because I know that I should do some more but actually you know I enjoyed it for a while and it's fine. So yeah. maybe I'll come back to it and maybe I won't. Yeah. So it's yeah, removing that pressure. Up. Does it matter? Who else cares about the stuff that's sitting in my drawer? Yeah. But you're right. <laughs> no <because> one. <laughs> once we've announced it to someone, you know, we've made that, oh my God, I'm really enjoying the screen printing or, you know, anything yeah. else. It's like, well, are you still doing it? You're still doing it. And it's like, oh, okay. I've now got to admit that actually I've lost that interest. But also if you're doing something creative, you want it to be fun. And the minute it stops being fun it's like well what's the point doing something creative and that's filling you up because it's there to the creativity is there to feed your soul and if it's not Mm. feeding your soul then I kind of think well yeah why I think for so many of us as well that's sort of so little so little spare time available to indulge any kind of creativity that uh, yeah we just need to be giving ourselves permission to do whatever it is we need to in those kind of little windows and margins that we can find or hopefully carve out bigger windows and margins to do that in if we can and even if you don't want to do anything at all and you just want to lie on the bed and watch tv then do it but just try and do it unapologetically without without... guilt yes (laughs) which is so much easier said than done that's a whole other podcast episode (laughs) we'll come back to that one (laughs) 
Oh, yeah. So, Kate, if there's anyone listening to this who has an inkling and kind of thinks, hmm, could this, you know, is this something that, that is worth checking out? I'm, I'm talking about the ADHD sort of diagnosis. Do you have any recommendations for them on sort of where to where to start? So I would say you can do an online kind of very simple test um, mm-hmm. that you, you can sort of find out what kind of percentage it looks like you could possibly have ADHD. That's not going to be your official diagnosis. No. But that can help you just be like, okay, this, there's something going on here that's worth um, getting checked out yeah and I would definitely def- do a bit of reading and then speak to your GP but go to your GP armed with knowledge and armed with a bit of a backbone that they're not going to fob you off because and I'm not berating uh, and criticizing any GPs I know they've got a really really hard mm. job but there are GPs out there that genuinely and I, I have experienced this especially slightly older ones who just women ADHD is just Very not a thing for them yeah it's plus just, you only get 10 minutes it's like yeah by, by the time you've explained <laughs> your yeah. kind of your backstory your 10 minutes is gone <laughs> yeah I educated my GP and I gave her every single I said this is the situation I said it's in my family this is how it looks in girls I sent her some articles and thankfully she was really open it was like okay thank you for this like I said I had a private diagnosis because it was just the waiting list was just so long and you've got to jump through so many hoops and again you know the system needs looking at because they are the guidelines are like mostly for males for men you know it's not they need to update all of this there's so many things that need updating in the private sector now for ADHD, especially women, it's a lot more experienced and specialised. And there's lots of amazing people there um, that can help you. So I would definitely do that. But try and hold your ground if you believe that this is it. And what will happen also is that you will see it in a family member as well. So very often, if you are, if you've got ADHD, your mum or one of your grandparents your your auntie you'll have seen it you'll have a a family member that you kind of look back and go oh they find it hard to stick to a job or they had several partners or their house was always chaotic and you know you'll be able to pick up things you know they're jumping from different thing to different person all these different things and back in you know a few generations ago that would have looked like they were just like, oh, that's mad Auntie Mary or that's, you know, crazy, you know, Aunt Lucy or whatever, where they're just a bit flighty and a bit crazy and creative and whatever, however you want to look at it. But, you know, on a more serious level, it might be looking at depression, anxiety, bipolar, where it can look like that. And it's also a comorbidity. So they could have Mm. depression and ADHD depression and and severe anxiety disorder so just have a little think about your family and see how that looks as well and obviously you know you you could be in your dad and your brother so for me it's a really strong gene in my side of the family so it's very highly likely that I mean I've already got one child diagnosed whether I'll have any more I don't know but right now it's very genetic it is a genetic trait so Mm -hmm. it's just it's a way to reflect and give you that confidence that you're not making things up and it's not a, 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 you know a figment of your imagination it's really happening and I jotted down um, one of the stats from that Vogue article I think which is that girls were nine times less likely than boys to be diagnosed and treated um, and I think you know it kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier about sort of this looking different in girls and women to the way that it kind of manifests perhaps in in boys and men and that being less well understood so as you say I think if you know if you have a GP or whoever who is you know not necessarily terribly well versed in this kind of I guess going in with that sort of understanding is really helpful and trying to kind of get that across. Yeah. And I think with, with my daughter, especially I, I turned into a sort of like this lioness (laughs) because I have not backed down. And I said, she, and thankfully she has an amazing send department in the school. The lady that runs it has been incredibly helpful writing letters backwards and forwards to um, the council and to the doctors making sure I got her on the right medication. I've done a huge amount of research, you know, now, being you know a well-being coach and working in well-being 
I help a lot of other women with ADHD and children because there's a massive connection between lifestyle and well-being choices and managing your ADHD, whether you want to be on medication or not. And mm. so it's not just getting your child or yourself on medication and everything else just falls into place. Huge amounts are, and, that, and that's what led me into training in well-being coaching because I had to manage my own well-being. And I was so interested from a young age that I had to just you know, look after myself, which is what's given me this passion to help other people with their lifestyle. So that is a huge part of it. So have a look at your, the way you exercise, what you eat, the way you de-stress, how much, you know, how many things you take on and Mm -hmm. what your boundaries are like and how you sleep and all these different things that can exacerbate ADHD. So you've got to look after yourself. And unfortunately, it takes a lot of time and there's a lot of effort. They call it the ADHD tax, where you do end up spending more money on yourself because self-care is so important in managing your your mental health and your mental well-being with ADHD. Um, It clearly can make a big difference if you're, you know, if you are able to sort of, you know, put all of those sort of support and self-care practices in place. Yeah. Kate, we, we, I feel like we could talk for another, um, another hour about this. (laughs) Um, thank you so much for for giving me your time today and I found this really really fascinating so I'm sure lots of other people will too and maybe you know some of this will will resonate with them and uh, I'm sure they will find it helpful thank I you hope so. so much oh it's a pleasure thank you for having me you've been listening to the middling along podcast do remember to subscribe to be notified when our next episode is live and why not visit the blog at www.middlingalong.com sign up to my newsletter as well i do hope you enjoyed listening today if you did i'd be really grateful if you would consider leaving a short review as that helps people find the podcast and helps get it noticed hope you can join us next time goodbye for now